So you actually have a strong incentive not to cheat because as soon as you cheat, you suffer individually because your own application moves down. Does that mechanism though have a downside insofar as people will start ranking based on what they think other people are ranking? And does that mean a kind of, you know, the popular trendy topics keep getting voted up and the big names get voted up? Is there a danger of kind of not having unusual decisions and a kind of hom homogeneity or something to the way the science field goes? I mean, I guess there's two, two parts to the answer to that, which is that, firstly, at some level, that's what you're trying to do, right? What the whole point of this exercise is, this, in a traditional peer review panel, is that what they're supposed to be doing is representing the views of the community. It isn't supposed to be their own individual prejudices. It's actually supposed to be what is good for the astronomical community, what broadly do people want the time to be spent on, not what do I individually want it to be spent on. So actually having a process which makes in each individual think, What's everybody else going to think? Isn't in itself necessarily a bad thing. It's not supposed to be about what do I think, what do I think is great, but actually, you know, what astronomically is, a, is, you know, is, is good for the community overall. The second aspect to this is that when, when you're doing a peer review, you actually get a set of instructions from the observatory as to what, you know, what they want you to look out for. So if, you know, and hopefully they'll say, look out for things which are really off the wall, look out for things which are really innovative, they're not just incremental, they're really revolutionary, all those kinds of things. And generally speaking, you know, there's no real incentive to take any notice of what those instructions to tell you to do because you can just do whatever you like and there's no real penalty. Suddenly you think, well, I've read this set of instructions and actually the other people who are going to be assessing these applications have read this set of instructions, so I'd better follow the instructions because that way I'll know that I'm ranking things to the same rules that everybody else is. Does this potentially penalise someone who's extra conscientious, that reviewer who reads the proposal really carefully and finds that one little flaw, that one clause on page nine, that brings the whole thing crashing down and penalise it accordingly and all the lazy reviewers didn't see it and therefore the conscientious person suffers. So this, this is the, the main criticism that's been levelled at this as a way of doing things and, and I, I'm happy to concede it is a point. To be fair, those kinds of things get missed anyway and actually, you know, maybe they'll get picked up, maybe they won't. Subsequent to actually coming up with this idea, I've modified it a little bit in that actually one of the ideas now is before you do this ranking, there's a pre-process where you actually re you read them all and then you write little comments on them. As you know, this is a really you know this proposal was done in 1973, and here's the reference to show you where it was. And then those comments get anonymously passed on to all the other people who've assessed that particular proposal, so that they actually know if you spot that fatal flaw, you can pass it on. They can check it out for themselves and actually be convinced by it. And that's really, you know, that's kind of mimicking what goes on in a conventional peer review panel that you discuss things and you say, actually, I found this, you know, this was done in 1973, so we really don't want to waste any more time on it. So this is not my area of expertise. I mean, yeah, I know a bit about astronomy, but this is electoral theory, right? This is voting and those kinds of things, which is, which is a you know, whole other academic discipline I know nothing at all about. And to be completely honest, what I did is I typed into Google uh, electoral theory astronomy. And it turns out there is one person in the world who is an expert in both electoral theory and astronomy. Besides this border guy. Uh, a bit, well, border is, is, was in the 18th century, I think, so he's a bit past calling on at this point. Uh, but there is one current astronomer who has published his papers both on astronomy and on electoral theory. He's a guy called Don Sari in California, who I didn't know at all. Um, so I did that classic thing of I just sent him an email saying, you don't know me, but uh, what do you think of this as an idea? And he got really excited about it and he had various suggestions about how to make it more robust in, and, and you know, fit in with these ideas of mechanism design, how you actually you know, can, can make these things really work. And so we ended up writing the paper together. And it's, it's the only time I've ever done that. I've never kind of sent anyone an unsolicited note saying, you know, you don't know me, but here's an idea, why don't we work on it? And I have to say it worked really well. I've still never met the guy. We've only ever communicated by email. Uh, but uh, we ended up writing really, it was quite a fun paper to write, and we ended up writing this paper together. And it, it did have, you know, when we published it, it got a lot of feedback. Lots of people read it and were either very rude about it or quite nice about it. What's happened since? Did it then, did it die as a good idea or? No, so at the time, I mentioned the European Southern Observatory was getting really nervous about the number of applications they were getting. They got so nervous they actually set up a working group to look at alternative ideas, partly motivated by this, um, this idea but also various other things that they were thinking about. So it got looked at quite closely by the European Southern Observatory. Um, the, one of the people who at that time was working at the European Southern Observatory subsequently went to work at the Gemini Observatory and uh, to, to run the Gemini Observatory and he's actually now got the Gemini Observatory 
implementing this scheme to allocate at least part of their telescope time as a test. And also the National Science Foundation, the NSF in the USA, which is you know, the biggest funder of science in the US, got interested in it because they were interested in how they replace their peer review process, not for allocating time on telescopes, for, but for allocating grants, how you give out grant money. And so just last year, they ran a pilot where they actually used this method to allocate the funding for one of their funding calls. And so it was actually has gone through this whole process of actually being used in reality. They've written it up as to how it worked out and the feedback seems to be it works very well. So actually it's, it can be used much more broadly than just for giving out telescope time. You can use it for, for any kind of allocation process where the people who are applying have a vested interest in, you know, in doing a proper job of allocating the funds properly. So it looks like it's one of these things that might actually acquire a momentum all its own and could actually become quite widely used as a way of allocating telescope time and allocating funds and all those kinds of things.